I'm going to give the bishop, of course, the last word, but I wanted to see if there is, I have a couple of last words, but anything that you're just curious about and Yes. I do have a question. Uh, the uh, responsibility of holy orders uh, makes it incumbent upon the bishop to take care of the church. Yes. Right. Now, how does that apply to deacons? Say that de a deacon would fall into penury and, and uh, would uh, the diocese then have to get support him or how far does that go? Yeah, yeah. The diocese would be under obligation by law to care for it's clergy. It doesn't mean employ them. It means to be sure that they're cared for. So whatever mechanism there would be. Um, and it well may be that, that, that the diocese decides to use, like in our diocese, we have what we call an assembly of deacons. You, if I can, the law of priests are in, there is a presbyteral council. There is no such canonical structure for deacons. But many dioceses will have a deacon community or assembly, they call it. And in our diocese, um, each parish pays some dues, I think it's like 125 bucks a year, to the diaconate assembly. And they have some other funding, and they actually take care of the most immediate needs of those. We've had deacons who can't make a house payment. So that, that diaconate community would be the first resource to go to. And that's the first mechanism that the diocese uses to take care of its diaconal clergy. Uh, but if, if there was a greater need, then the diocese has some obligation to see that they're cared for. The law doesn't spell out what that is. Just as it has an obligation to care for the priests. Doesn't spell out exactly what that is. We use the word faculties for priests. Do you use that word for deacons? Yes, we do. Thank you. We use the word faculties for deacons. So once a man is ordained, he receives a canonical appointment stating what the faculties are, where he's assigned whether again it's parish or non-parish or both or some combination, uh, to, to exercise one's diaconal ministry in another diocese. A deacon needs to seek permission from that diocese following a protocol of exchange between the chancellors on behalf of the bishops to ensure that the deacon is in good standing. I'm not aware that you asked of that for me coming down. Maybe you presume that because it was a bishop and director formation, which tends to happen in my case, but, but um, technically, yeah, you know, in order to even assist in Mass, certainly to preach, certainly to do one of the, one of the other sacraments, I need permission. And then we also use incardination and excardination to describe a deacon transferring to another diocese. We were talking about irregularities and some of those issues that surround, might surround um, just families. Uh, what in irregularities, spouse or children, do they have any impact on that? And the of irregularities that would be evaluated going into a formation program? There's a lot of issues there that you brought up, and that's right. interesting to think about. Those are canonical irregularities. Those are the only ones defined under the law. And there's a protocol for how to seek a dispensation. As I said, there are any number of other issues that are not technical irregularities, but are real issues, often having to do with the family, uh, family, work, health. One's, oh, if someone asked the question, could a felon, is a felony an, an irregularity? No, not under canon law. Is it an issue you want to investigate? Yes. <laughs> so the complication process kind of weeds out or teases out all that in a way that Yes, all, all I've done there is give you the absolute, and, and, and dispensation from, a, from an irregularity, all that does is it brings somebody to square one so that they can actually apply. 
the norms are that now irregularities, irregularities must be taken care of, dispensed with, before a man even enters aspirancy. It doesn't serve anybody to wait till six months before ordination and go, oh, and you can't get him ordained because you're waiting to hear something back from Rome. That's I was thinking about my experience of RCA today. You tell them the first week, you know, you make sure if we have some issues in marriage, you need to address those. Then you get to the last week, and it's like, well, I didn't think you were talking to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, are very, we are very clear. We, we state it verbally uh, in large group several times. They see it in writing, and I'll ask directly some of the questions in an interview. I realize that the sacrament of the anointing is reserved for priests because of, of the sacrament of, of absolution. Is there anything that in the future that the deacon could do the sacrament of the anointing if confession is not uh, involved? I have had a priest of 60 years say that possibly once or twice has he ever heard the confession of, as anointing simply because the person is already common tools. And he thought that it would be a good, good thing for a deacon to be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> 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 I, I realize well, that. In, in fact, if you go back in the history, you'll find that uh, there have been regional councils that have addressed that issue back centuries ago. And deacons cannot do anointing. Um, and it actually was also addressed again, I'm trying to think when it was, in a paper, there was a dubium submitted to Rome, there was a response, a clear protocol, clarification, no, deacons cannot do it. The question has been raised numerous times. Because of its connection to the sacrament of reconciliation, the forgiveness of sin, which faculty is reserved to the priest flowing from his role as priest in, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, right? Very clear, there's nothing on the horizon that would suggest otherwise. Whether or not a priest hears a confession is beside the point. So I do not foresee, in your scenario that you described, if they were ever separated out, might that be a role for a deacon? Sure, amen. Let's wait till they're separated out, <laughs> if ever. So the answer is no. <laughs> what else? What else? Anything else that you asked? Questions, concerns? I didn't even bring up the continence issue. You, know, you, you might be aware that there's a debate out there right now. If deacons who are married get ordained, do they forsake sexual intercourse? I think I'd that one out. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'll just mention it because it, you'll see it on the internet. It's a live issue. Deacon, or not deacon, but canonist Dr. Ed Peters up in Sacred Heart in Detroit raised it. He did a historical analysis of the canons and how the Code of Canon Law 1983 was developed and the exemptions that are granted under clerical rights and duties, and duties and obligations, which ones are exempt for permanent deacons, it's all spelled out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, perpetual continence exemption was removed by John Paul II from the draft. The exemption was removed, which would suggest that permanent deacons who are married ought to observe perpetual continence, which Peter, and Peter says is, is, the, is the main reason why wives need to give express written permission for the husband to be ordained. And he does an historical analysis of the role of continence within marriage for those who are ordained in the Western church, and certainly periodic continence in the East. Um, I think he makes a great case for it from a purely historical, theological standpoint. I agree with him. I also agree with his suggestion, and he's been raked over the coals for this, unfortunately by deacons who don't understand sacramental theology or 
moral theology or theology of marriage. It shows up when they, in their blog responses, you know. It's a little embarrassing, but it also just says, so the solution is either begin to form men to embrace perpetual continence or change the law. And why is the, the reason, why is it not being observed? Um, seems to be because John Paul II and Benedict both seem to have conflated the traditional distinction between celibacy and continence into one. And therefore you don't need the exemption. That's all too theological, don't worry about it. No one is mandating anywhere that married deacons abstain from sexual intercourse. With their wives. <laughs> <laughs> I would, however, suggest that deacons, if they understand, and the marriage, those their spouses, if they understand the fullness of marital chastity and marriage and intercourse within marriage, particularly as a sign value and particularly as it's related to holy orders, might embrace periodic continence, as St. Paul suggests at times, for the sake of prayer and for a high a higher end, which, which end fulfills what intercourse itself points to. That's not a popular idea. <laughs> I've said just that to my wife at times, and she'll say, do you really want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything else that, that um, I, I hope this has been a helpful walk through so much, and, and we've just been on tip of the iceberg on so much of this, especially with formation, there's, um, there's whole, we do a whole week in our institute on what formation should look like, um, and it's really, a, it's, a, it's a bigger project than you might think at first. Again, I recommend investing at that level, I know that's where you're at. But especially working at, at coming up with, in spite of the logistical difficulties, uh, many dioceses, many countries have those difficulties, but work at, at a unified formation program so that you don't unwittingly, and by unified, I also mean integrated with a certain kind of lay formation and even priestly formation, much like you're doing here, so that you don't unwittingly create silos of different ecclesiologies pastoral practices, which can unwittingly evolve when you do everything in a disparate way. So that that's where I would put my energy. I envy you because you're in a great place, uh, both because you're just kind of getting this diaconate really going, and you're actually stopping to talk about it. That is really, I mean, this is good. This is really good. And it's an enviable posi position to be in. And as I said earlier, it's just evident to me that you really do have a strength of camaraderie here that you should build on as you address the questions of diaconate and other types of ministry. So, so amen to that, all right? Let me, let, me, let me conclude by just reading this scripture, which would be my hope and prayer for you coming from Paul to the Colossians. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Thank you very much for your patience these last two days and for your very gracious hospitality. God bless you, and let's welcome your bishop.
Joseph for being here and being part of this, realizing he's very busy, etc. But I'm delighted that he came to spend these two days with us. So I think we ought to give him a very special round of applause. <laughs> second discussion on uh, what I would call kind of human resource management. Uh, basically, in 101 management, human resource management 101, anytime you bring a new person into your staff, you change the configuration. And I would say the two most serious issues that I dealt with in terms of the staff in the Air Force, it was the maintenance person that we hired. Because that person could lock doors and change locks and just make life miserable. <laughs> and we couldn't fire him. So that person did more damage and more difficulty, but it's a very simple thing. Anytime you bring in a new person, anytime we brought in a, a new recruit from basic training, airmen slick sleeves as we called them, no authority, no rank, no experience, you kept your eyes open, that person could change the entire dynamics of a staff of 12 to 15 people in a chapel set. Uh, the Air Force, as I was telling Joseph, uh, is much more robust in terms of human resource management than the Catholic Church. We're very, very deficient nationwide and worldwide in human resource management in the Catholic Church. We just kind of assume that everybody will get along and everything will work out. And in the Air Force, we always had three things that you wanted to keep on top of. People, money, and conflict. And every time you got promoted, you had to go to a three-week course or a one-week course. What you study? People, conflict management, and resources, money. If, when I was a, selected for one star, I had to go to school for a full month. What we study? Conflict resolution, mm -hmm. material resources, and human resources. So when you come into a diocese like this, and uh, typical, most typical, human resource management is done by Part of it's done here, part of it's done there, and the majority of it is not done. So that's why we have those questions this morning. That uh, I'm not surprised that we sense tension in our staff. Every time you move a pastor, you can expect one thing. Conflict, difficulty adjusting, doesn't do it like a previous person, has new ideas. Uh, so I would just emphasize that that's one of the that's one of the conditions that we have to live with. And we're not very good at it because we don't invest any money. Uh, if, if we were a typical corporation of a budget of 3.1 million or 2.8 million, you would have a full-time human resource management office. Not just a person, but an office. So uh, I empathize or sympathize with the difficulties that we have in uh, human resource management. <laughs> But that's just the condition, that's just the way the church is. And uh, they're not going to change because I think it's not sufficiently robust. But I would just add that as a comment this morning. But Father Torpy's question, let me get that very specifically in a very brief time. Where did the uh, permanent diaconate situation come in the diocese? This morning you aired uh, some of the history. And I know the history, you know the history. It was just not thought of as a, a need or since it's 1968 time frame. Uh, you know, I think it would just be right, our friend Bishop McNamara did not want the permanent diaconate. His views were uh, that it would interfere with lay ministry, it would interfere with the priesthood, etc. A lot of it would be what he classified as uh, initial perceptions of the permanent diaconate and its meaning and its function, but I think that's been very, very thoroughly addressed by Deacon Joseph, so I don't have to go back on that. How did it get started? I think it was in 2006, uh, the priests gathered in North Platte. Prior to that, we sent out what we called the SWAT, Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats to the Church. And out of that SWAT came a recommendation that we explore the permanent diaconate. It was just one of the goals and one of the objectives so that was uh, in place before we had our, our formal uh, 
process about three years ago, the needs assessment of the diocese, where we went through the uh, what are some of the issues, et cetera, and the planning, the five-year plan that we talked about for the diocese. So prior to that, it was reinforced by that people would gather, and we put it in uh, something like 12,000 responses came into the West Nebraska Register on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things in there was an affirmation that we should explore, look into the permanent diaconate. The next step was uh, when Father Richard Pinkusky came back from the Army from a tour of duty one year uh, prior to that. He was on temporary duty. He, I remember him emailing me and saying, uh, why are we pushing all these other things but we're not pushing the permanent diaconate? So I emailed him the SWAT and said, this has been a suggestion and a recommendation and we're, uh, we should look into it. So he and I had a discussion and we came up with the idea, well, let's go down to Omaha because Omaha has had the permanent diaconate uh, since about 1970. That was my background. Uh, that was after I went into the Air Force that that came out. But my classmates and priest friends told me a lot about the permanent diaconate in Omaha. In the Air Force, some of the bases I was assigned to had a permanent deacon. Military people could become permanent deacons. The diff difficulty was they became a permanent deacon. Typical assignment in the Air Force is four years. So it took the four year process. Most of the time before they were ordained a permanent deacon, they moved to another place and then they completed it there. <coughs> Sometimes I inherited a permanent deacon when I came into a staff, into a base. So that was my experience there. When I came back home in 2002, uh, we had four permanent deacons at St. Stephen the Martyr. Uh, and they came in different envelopes, they did different things. So liturgically they were pretty consistent in what they did, but they really had real different uh, issues there. There we had a contract that we had to sign and renew with the permanent deacon every year. So that was my background, so we went down to Omaha to see the permanent diaconate uh, formation. And a couple of you here went through that. They used to have the rural center for permanent diaconate formation and the city center. And it was Father Rodney Adams, who at that time was the director of it. And he showed us their center with their TV capabilities, their broadcast cap capabilities, and they were downlinking it to Norfolk. If you can downlink it to Norfolk, why can't you downlink it to Grand Island? So they readily agreed and we purchased the equipment and that was the start of it. We hitchhiked on the, the Omaha program and it was centered in Cathedral because that's where the first candidates came from. So we did that for about two and a half to three years. And then uh, Omaha went through a uh, change of understanding of the formation of permanent deacons. And that's when Deacon Keating came in. Uh, prior to that, it was always a priest who was the director. And they, they did follow the, the typical things, the human formation, the spiritual formation, the pastoral formation, and intellectual formation. But as you would gather when it done what we call it a web, webinar, it got highly lecture-oriented. And when Deacon Keating came in, he said, that's not the way adults learn. That's not the best process. So they disbanded their TV center, their Deacon Center in Omaha. And they no longer downlinked it to uh, Norfolk. And they made the decision to uh, do a like, seminar formation, pro uh, seminar approach, uh, rather than through downlinking uh, to Norfolk and the Grand Island. And so they now have the program, unless they've changed it in the past three or four weeks. If you want to become a permanent deacon in Omaha, you have to go to Norfolk one weekend every month. Get there Friday afternoon, 6 o'clock, I think, and you leave at 6 o'clock Sunday night. And it's at a retreat center, Benedictine Retreat Center in Norfolk. But it's strictly a seminar formation. Now, Deacon Keating has gone through all of the curriculum development, et cetera, so it covers all the aspects of the human, spiritual, pastoral, and intellectual formation, and that they have to do things outside of that weekend. We thought about driving, having people drive to Norfolk to participate in that, but that was unrealistic from a logistics point of view, from an expense point of view. So that's when we said, well, can we imitate and follow using uh, formators? Can we use that uh, seminar formation here, using all of your materials? So those of you who are in it now, those materials come and they're developed by uh, 
the content of all of that has been developed by Nathan Keating, so it's basically the Omaha resources that we use. And then the question came up, well, why do we, can't we get beyond being restricted to the city of Grand Island? That's when uh, Scott's Bluff started a year and a half ago or a year ago, doing the same thing, four major local pastor using it in the seminar approach. The only difficulty is, uh, as Dan will note, that it's a seminar of one with the pastor, so there's some limitations to that. We also have in the plans to do it here in North Platte, so it would be basically three centers, a four major for the place in uh, Grand Island, four majors for the place here in North Platte, and four major for the Scotts Bluff area. So that's where we are now, and that basically is uh, tailored and conditioned by what Omaha does in terms of the content of those discussions and those seminars. We elected not to do the one weekend a month because of logistics. We don't have a retreat center, etc. So we now do it on Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night, mean for what, two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, deacons who have been ordained come into that as a continuation and a formation and as a resource of peer group for the, those who are already confirmed or are already ordained. <laughs> now, I say that confirmation, one of our deacons in the process we discovered after he's in it for a while he was never confirmed. I don't think that would be invalidating, but those are the kind of things that you miss when you don't have a real a strict uh, interview process where you ever confirm. As certainly you asked the baptismal certificate, which then had the First Communion data on it, but nobody uh, looked at her closely to see that this individual was never confirmed. But fortunately, we caught it early enough in the first year of the formation so we could work with that. Now, so as, as far as the uh, director of the permanent diaconate formation, that would still be Father Richard Munkuski. He is a member of the NADDP, National Association of Diocesan Directors of the Diaconate. Uh, we had it lined up that he would go to Josephina about a year and a half ago, but his military duties, he still a reservist, interfered with that, so he did not go, but that's one of the things that we should do, especially with our four members, and to be part of that. Uh, are there limitations to the seminar approach? Probably. Are there limitations to the, uh, the formation that we would uh, that would be very consistent with and ideal? Uh, I would say that we're kind of in the infancy stage, and we we know some of the things that we're not doing. And the last few days, I discovered a lot of things that I didn't know we weren't doing, and things like that. So I appreciate your helping us to get a wider vision of what the permanent diaconate. Some, somebody asked a question that would fit into this. Well, how do you get started? What if somebody is interested? Well, one of the things I've made very, very clear to Father Richard and to anyone and to the North Platte priests here, you just have to have a, this person walks on water recommendation from your pastor. And we're going to ask the question, What's the history of service of this individual in the parish? Is it a long history that this person has a long 10 year history of being involved in service aspects of the parish, parish council, uh, social justice committees, religious education formation, adult formation, adult <coughs> education. Is this person uh, really involved in a lot of what we call service to the church activities? Now, one case to remember, uh, remember Father Richard called me and said, do you know such and such from X parish? I said, obviously I don't. I said, why don't you call the pastor? And the pastor said, I don't know who you're talking about, I've never seen him. Well, he just made an appointment with Father Richard about the uh, diaconate, permanent diaconate. But he wasn't registered in any parish and no parish knew him. Well, it didn't take long to say no, because there's no history of service. Uh, charitable Christian service to an individual parish. So that's really the starting point, unless there's just a glorious recommendation from the pastor. Uh, it's going to be delayed, if not just turned down, because that's the starting point, I think, is the sense of service. That this person has a tremendous sense of service to the parish in various ways. 
So that's basically how it got started. It was reinforced in the uh, five-year planning that we did uh, three years ago. And it, but it was initiated, initiated by that SWAT, Strengths, Opportunities, Weaknesses, and Threats. And so my, my initial reaction was, if you want the fullness of borders, you need the, for the presence of deacons, permanent deacons. Um, if you just have the, the bishop and priest, you don't have the full expression of the of sacred orders in the diocese. So that was, that was more of a selling point. It wasn't the shortage of priests, because uh, deacons are going to do things kind of uh, beyond and, and way outside what the priests do and what the bishop does. So if you want the fullness, then you have to have permanent deacons, uh, or deacons, priests, and a bishop uh, for the fullness of orders. Now, I'm not, I'm not naive about how deacons will be adjusting into parishes. It's just management one-on-one, human resource one-on-one. You bring in an additional person into your staff, uh, into your parish, not just the paid staff, the volunteer staff, you bring another person into the parish configuration, that changes you. Changes the perception of the people, well, what is this person doing here? What is a permanent deacon? Well, it's going to change the configuration of your parish. That's just basic human resource management when you bring in new people. You bring in uh, somebody, it's very simple. You bring in somebody who's been a DRE for 10 years in an X parish, and they move to Y parish, and they say, I've been a DRE for 10 years. Can I assist in any way? What's the first response? Are you here to take over? Are you, you know, be blunt about it. You want me to fire our present DRE and hire you? Uh, that's just common to communities and common to staff that there's an adjustment every time somebody comes into the parish. There's an adjustment any time somebody comes into the parish staff. If you add a, a member to your staff, say, well, I think we ought to have somebody in charge of uh, social outreach. Well, the first question the others who are on the staff, volunteer, are going to say, well, what's that going to do to what we do? Is that going to conflict with what we do? Are you going to get the money that we should have got? Uh, so that's kind of the, so I think we ought to be uh, just very realistic about the integration of permanent deacons into the entire uh, diocesan structure into our, our communities. I thought that Omaha had about 150 to 160 permanent deacons. You mentioned around 200. Maybe those who have ex-cardinated from Omaha, incarnated here. What's the number you I want guess? to slow the difference and say 175. I think it's 240. <laughs> 240. <laughs> 240 permanent deacons. Now, one of the parishes next to we had three in a parish of 15,000 people. Two priests and 15,000 people and three permanent deacons in that. They really worked out quite well. But the parish next to me, I think it was St. Gerald's and Ralston, had 13 Ooh. permanent deacons. Now, how do you integrate 13 deacons into a parish that probably only had about 10 or 12,000 people? They did a lot of diverse things outside of the parish, but they also liturgically did things inside the parish. But I think that was, as I was leading my bishop, Curtis reassigned about four or five of them to parishes that did not have permanent deacons. But they stayed right within the city, so that's different than driving a 425 miles from Harrison to Grand Island or Grand Island to Harrison. Uh, that, so that situation worked out pretty well there. So we're going to continue to uh, develop, and the problem, not the problem, but the issue is it got to be realistic. The understanding of the permanent beacon is advancing and developing, and we're not going to catch up with it for quite a while because we're from infancy developing. We've only had permanent deacons ordained three years, John. So uh, we've only had an experience of three years that's pretty localized. So we'll continue to develop it. And, uh, but I fear that the, uh, the theology and the mission of the permanent diaconate will continue to grow and grow pretty rapidly as more research is done, as more institutes like Josephinum, 
more places where the deacon formation is working. And uh, so we're going to have a hard time just kind of keeping behind. <laughs> well, we're, we're just, we'll make every effort not to get any more behind than we are now uh, in terms of the development of it. But, but I like the idea that Deacon Joseph said to me after this discussion that we had informally and much more brief, briefly. Said, Somewhere you just have to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead it. So we're kind of going to a deep trust of the Holy Spirit to help us to lead this and to develop this. And uh, I would really underline what Deacon Joseph said. This is not going to address our priest shortage. To make deacons fill in for what priests do, that just doesn't make any sense. It, liturgically and structurally, their ministry and their identity is different. It's a different configuration to holy orders and being a bishop or a priest. So I appreciate the work that those who are involved in are doing. I hope it can continue to grow. Uh, I think one of the things that all pastors and staff members should do is keep their eyes and ears open. Who would be a good candidate for the permanent diaconate in our parish? You might come to the judgment, I don't know of anyone right now. That, that could be very valid. But there might be someday somebody who say, this person, I think, with their history of service, their history of uh, participation in the parish, it'd be worth asking if you ever considered it. And we still have the, uh, the travel problem. The Highway 20 corridor is quite a ways from Grand Island, Scotts Bluff, and North Platte. So those are the things that we're working with. So I, it's 3 o'clock, and I start talking, I get carried away, and most of you wish I would be carried away. Right? <laughs> <laughs>